your host today for learn at UBAM session. Today's session, uh, today's topic is is Japan really reawakening, and why are we interested in Japan? How does it affect us? How do we take advantage of this? The agenda for today is the introduction to UBAM. Then we'll have Mr. Alexandra Hart sharing with us is Japan really a re reawakening. After a quick introduction to UBM Invest Direct Fund Direct, we'll have the Q&A session. Before we kick off today's session, let's go through some of the familiar functions in Zoom which you can use. The chat box is available for you to raise any issues to the host and my colleagues will assist you. You can click on the Q&A question to ask questions throughout the session and this is important as we will be picking up questions from the Q&A to ask our, uh, our guests. Click on the like button to upvote questions raised in the Q&A session. And the QR codes are available for you to scan with your phone. You can access feedback forms and download our app or pages. And the, click, the links are available for you to click in the chat box. Now, for those of you who are familiar with us, thank you for joining our webinar today. For those who are new, welcome. UOBM is an Asian powerhouse with over 35 years in the making. We are a leading regional asset manager committed to promoting investment excellence, driving innovations, and embracing sustainability. Our purpose is to create value for our investors, partners, and communities, and to help them achieve their goals and aspirations. With our vision and strategic pillars, we at UOBM invest for profit and purpose while shaping a better world for future generations. As of 30th of April, we have more than 90 investment professionals across nine markets in Asia, managing more than 31.1 billion of our clients' assets. Our accolades saw us receive multiple awards and our consistency in our performance is a testament to our strong investment management capabilities, as well as disciplined investment approach. Do visit our website for more details and the full list of our awards. Before we move on with today's agenda, let me introduce our speaker for today. Mr. Alexandra Hart has eight years of industry experience in relationship management and product management, with a particular focus on Japanese and global equities. Prior to joining SMDAM, he spent three years at Asset Management One as a product manager with the Global Sales Department based in Tokyo, where he oversaw the relationship with EMEA institutional clients. He has also held the role of product specialist with the global sales team at Sampo Asset Management. Alex obtained a BA from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and is fluent in Japanese. Hi, Alex. Hi, Bart, and hi, hi to all of our listeners today. Yes. Hi. Uh, maybe, Alex, you can take it away. Yep, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. So while I just get the slides on the screen, I'll just give you a warm welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Alexander Hart, and uh, as uh, Bart introduced, um, I'm a product specialist with Sumitomo uh, DSAM, Asset Management. Um, I've been living for the past 10 years in Tokyo, uh, but I'm originally from the UK. And I think that it gives me uh, maybe a bit of a different perspective um, on the situation in Japan um, we see today. And I look forward to sharing uh, you know, some insights with you on um, what we're seeing on the ground today. Uh, during the course of the webinar. So um, now the slides are uh, on the screen. As um, we stand here in 2023, uh, Japan is still the world's third largest economy, and it's known for getting many things right. The stock market, um, which peaked all the way back in 1990 during the bubble era, however, uh, is not typically um, widely regarded as one of the attractive points um, of the country. Um, and it's thought to consist of highly economically sensitive old economy companies. Indeed, um, for the majority of the past 10 years, uh, institutional investors, um, global investors, have been underweight um, Japan equity relative to global equities. And I've been talking to uh, global institutional investors um, about Japanese equities uh, pretty much for the best part of my career. And we typically have come across, um, come up against the same kinds of skepticism about the market. So I'm sure you'll be you know, well aware of the idea of challenging demographics, 
uh, old economy industries, deflation, and so on. But recently, um, Japan appears to be back. Uh, the is, the market is uh, near post-bubble highs. And uh, more recently, the tone from investors is changing. So the, I think the question we really need to ask is, uh, is Japan really reawakening? Or is this just uh, in a more sleepwalking? And that's what I hope to, uh, you know, hope to um, help you to uh, understand uh, during the session today. So the first slide, um, we titled this presentation, Is Japan Really Reawakening? Because we think that it's natural for investors to be skeptical about Japan. There have been several false dawns uh, in the stock market, and the economy is faced indeed with the challenging structural issues that we discussed on the previous slide. I want to start the presentation, though, with this chart, which I think provides um, some food for thought. The chart on the screen shows growth in corporate earnings over the past 10 years for companies listed in the US, Europe, and Japanese markets. I haven't labeled which is which. Um, which do you think uh, it represents Japan? Well, it may be surprising that the dark blue line with 187% uh, corporate earnings growth over the past 10 years, which is uh, a compound annualized earnings growth of 12%, just over 12%, more than in fact the uh, US S&P 500 with its mega cap tech names. Um, and as a reminder, uh, corporate earnings growth is a key driver uh, of uh, stock market performance over the long term. So the message is Japanese companies are certainly awake and they're more profitable than ever. But what about the stock market itself? So recently, as I'm sure all are aware, there's been a huge rally uh, in Japanese equities. And I want to take, start by taking stock of where we are today. On the next slide, um, we've listed uh, performance of some key global equity markets year to date. So with that uh, improved corporate earnings picture in mind from the previous slide, let's look at the reasons behind the rally this year. The chart shows that Japanese stocks have been the top performers this year by a wide margin. And this is especially uh, true of the uh, large cap oriented N Nikkei 225 index, which is commonly bought by investors to gain quick exposure to the market. Let's bear in mind also that the Japanese market has done relatively well over the past 10 years. The currency, the yen, has depreciated uh, versus uh, major global currencies over the same period. So it hasn't been obvious for global investors. But in yen terms, Topix is up over 100 percent, slightly over 100 percent uh, from 2013. Particularly strong performance recently, um, including more than 25 percent year to date on the Nikkei, has brought uh, Japan's stock market to center stage. But I'd like to argue today that the seeds of the recent rally were sown long ago, you know, more than a decade ago. Um, as we saw on the first page, uh, we saw that companies have been growing earnings consistently and sustainably here. So what is really behind this rally? And I want to bring it uh, down to today three uh, you know, major factors, and I've labeled them the three R's, and we're all using the word uh, re- uh, from reawaken, but note we haven't uh, included the word reawaken. Instead, we've said reborn, um, and I'm going to talk about exactly what that means, uh, you know, on the next slide. So rebirth is arguably the most important of these factors. This refers to a process of gradual improvement in corporate fundamentals that started, as we say, more than a decade ago. The first point I would argue then is that Japan is not only already awake. Uh, certainly um, through the eyes of, uh, of corporate earnings. In fact, it has been reborn. So the key driver I'm going to talk about, um, which has been backed by national level commitment to improved corporate governance, uh, certainly doesn't sound as sexy as generative AI, but it has helped to generate the sustained profit growth that uh, has powered the stock market so far. And that I think, and uh, at the firm here, we believe has positioned Japanese equities strongly to continue to outperform relative to other countries in investors allocations over the next uh, mid to long term. So, uh, you know, five plus year uh, horizon, if we're talking um, horizons there. Um, on the next slide, uh, I've listed just a few of the incremental improvements to corporate governance infrastructure in Japan. So prior to the reforms, on the screen here, uh, corporate legislation in Japan had been untouched for over 50 years, and there wasn't even any guidance on corporate governance. 
As a result, companies were poorly run and investor capital was not allocated efficiently. Current strong performance of the stock market has been attributed to investments by Warren Buffett and uh, other factors such as concern over investments in uh, China uh, in a geopolitical context. Um, it's true that these have been important catalysts, but let's dig a bit deeper. So I would argue that the fundamental reason is because Japan's stock market is now att more attractive relative to history in terms of total shareholder return. So companies themselves are delivering stronger returns for investors. If we were rewind to 2012, which is uh, on the screen uh, on the left uh, hand side there, stock market returns were lackluster. Uh, we had uh, the global financial crisis and uh, corporate scandals in the uh, early to late 2000s in Japan. This didn't help, but the core reason, um, you know, we believe was low profitability. And so corporate strategy in Japan was still largely based around uh, volume growth as opposed to um, intelligent uh, you know, uh, uh, margin um, uh, control and pricing strategy, et cetera. Um, and this is really an artifact of uh, post-war industrial top-down policy. So Japan had a bad reputation for poor treatment of shareholders. Corporate boards lacked independence. Uh, shareholder votes were all but uh, meaningless. And uh, in some ways, you know, this reputation was certainly deserved uh, at the time, given the track record. But things have definitely changed. So Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, who, who uh, you know, tragically passed away, um, came to power in late 2012. Uh, he launched the Three Arrows program, uh, you may have heard of, uh, you know, called uh, Abenomics, which is focused around economic growth strategy and corporate reforms. The reforms, which many global investors, uh, you know, tend to think of as having failed, uh, what, what they actually have done, you know, behind the scenes, I would say, in our view, is they have uh, promoted shareholder capitalism by targeting both companies and institutional investors in Japan, uh, you know, promoting value creation through in innovatives like greater board diversity, uh, selling of strategically held shares by companies, and uh, you know, setting of appropriate uh, management KPIs, all of which you know, were, pr were procedures that were lacking in the Japanese market prior to that. And so what has happened as a result? Well, this slide shows how return on equity in the Japanese market, which is one measure of corporate capital efficiency, has been on an improving trend over the last 10 years. Of course, we see a blip uh, you know, during the COVID pandemic, as with uh, you know, pretty much all uh, nations. But we, right, we rose back to just above the 8% level at the end of 2022. And that is from a low base of uh, you know, 4% uh, coming into Abenomics in 2012. So corporate reforms we really see are instigating improvements in governance, uh, capital allocation, and shareholder return policies. And from a bottom-up fundamental perspective, we are seeing important signs of change in management behavior. But what does this mean for investors? I mean, it sounds like semantics, right? We need to uh, you know, hear about what uh, is the real outlook going forward. And is this just history? Is this even important? Let's then look and explore you know, the second R uh, on the screen today. So we have, uh, the second R is rediscovered. So rediscovered uh, refers to the more recent phenomenon, particularly which has accelerated in 2023, whereby long-term in oriented investors, uh, most notably, uh, you know, uh, potentially the most prolific investor, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, are taking another look at Japan. And this type of rediscovery uh, by foreign investors has happened before. Uh, it happened in late 2005 with uh, policy expectations around the Koizumi administration, and it happened in 2013 when Abe came to power for his second uh, you know, uh, uh, stint. So we discussed on the previous slide Abenomics uh, and corporate governance reform. Um, and uh, indeed, it, during the last bout of uh, you know, so-called rediscovery from 2013 to 2015, uh, there was much excitement about the Japanese stock market, but global investors saw progress in corporate governance as slow, and this led the rally to, st to stall, and uh, then global investors all but forgot about uh, Japan, um, resulting in pretty much, you know, underweight in the equity, and I saw that, um, you know, throughout my career uh, promoting Japanese equities to uh, institutional investors. Um, but as we will see, or as we've seen, sorry, on the previous slides, 
This was all as the Japanese stock market was in fact actually delivering stronger earnings growth than even the US S&P 500, despite being right in the middle of the mega tap, cap tech uh, in a fueled uh, market. So it's true that corporate governance um, reforms have taken time, but given the magnitude of the changes, uh, this is certainly to be expected uh, in our view. And I think that what sets this particular rediscovery apart from previous cases is that now the heavy lifting on the policy side with corporate governance and stewardship code on the institutional investor side is already done. So the framework is in place and companies can continue to uh, improve corporate earnings going forward in a much more sustainable manner, uh, I would say, relative to the past. So let's look at a couple of the factors then that exactly what uh, global investors are looking at when it comes to Japan. And coming into 2023, uh, amid a delayed re-emergence from the pandemic, um, there was essentially a new impetus to take another look at Japan. And I've uh, captured this using the four factors uh, here on the screen, which the Japanese economy and market had coming into 2023. I think that you know one way to think about it is uh, you know, having a whole constellation maybe of stars aligned for the market at once. It's quite a rare situation in markets. And indeed, the exogenous shock of uh, COVID, I think, um, you know, provided uh, an important uh, you know, uh, impetus for that. Um, the US market then, um, for example, arguably also has most of these components. But I would uh, argue that it is not cheap uh, with price to earnings well above the historical average uh, at uh, you know almost 20 times uh, earnings, forward earnings at the moment. Uh, and the outlook also relies on growing revenue expectations, um, you know, particularly focused around the, uh, the, the generative AI theme. So there's no question in our minds that AI will be transformative, but I think it's too early to pick winners and losers um, you know, in that particular theme. Investors are looking to diversify their global allocation coming from an underweight in Japanese equities. And we see this uh, you know, through strong inflows, not just to Japanese equities, but also to other developed markets, including Germany and France, which have also performed strongly relative to the US market coming into 2023. I want to talk about another element of rediscovery, which is the trading of Japanese equities. So this chart uh, shows the, uh, the net position of foreign investors in Japanese equities since uh, 2012. So the red line uh, going upward indicates net buying of equities and uh, going downward indicates net selling. So why is this important? Because 70% of trading of Japanese stocks is performed by foreign investors. So this means that when foreign investors are sellers, it tends to put downward pressure on prices. And on the flip side, when they're buyers, we usually see price appreciation, as we have done uh, coming into this year, where foreign investors have been net buyers for uh, you know, almost a record 10 weeks uh, straight. So as we discussed earlier, uh, the Abenomics era, uh, you can see on the chart there marked uh, in the period uh, 2012 to around 2015, uh, foreign investors quickly increased their holdings of Japanese equities, uh, but gradually sold the shares again, as we talked about, uh, you know, time being taken for the reforms to come through and really disenfranchisement, uh, despite, you know, solid evidence of higher corporate earnings growth, um, again, that we talked about uh, on par or stronger than even the uh, US uh, S&P 500. But now uh, foreign investors are starting to buy shares back. And you can see uh, the most uh, rightmost part of the chart, the red line uh, just uh, you know, starting to edge upwards. This data is from uh, May. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, you know, foreign in investors have actually increased even further from where we see. But there's ample room, room to increase um, if we see uh, you know, investors uh, overweight uh, Japan or even move to perhaps neutral weight in global equity from an underweight. Uh, there's also strong um, support for the market in uh, share buybacks. So Japanese companies are buying back uh, about 2 to 3% of the market every year. Um, so that's about uh, looking to be about 9 trillion uh, yen in buybacks this year. Uh, it's on par with last year's figures. And we also see increased interest from Japanese individuals who have traditionally been net sellers, but have interestingly turned to net buyers uh, over the last several years. Um, stronger dividend yields, and uh, you know, concerns over inflation and protecting assets uh, are potential factors uh, behind that. So let's look at the final R here, 
The final R is re-rating. So when we invest, we think about things in relative terms. And re-rating is the concept of revaluing something after having reassessed it relative to different metrics. And uh, you know, common examples are peer group and uh, history. So global investors took note of the combination of positive market fundamentals, economic drivers, momentum, and relative safety that I discussed on the last page, and accelerated buying of Japanese stocks. As a result, coming into 2023, uh, the, this is the price earnings multiple of the Japanese market um, and also the US market, just for reference there. So this chart shows that when the rally began, uh, you know, late December, valuations of Japanese equities were cheap, both compared to other uh, you know, global equities uh, characterized here by the US and also by their own history. So if you look at the um, red line uh, representing Japanese equities, uh, you can see that uh, the historical uh, you know, bottom is around uh, 12, 12 times uh, price to earnings. So when the rally began, uh, the earnings were, the, uh, the multiple was close to this. And that is despite the fundamental improvement in the corporate uh, earnings growth perspective um, you know, in the market. So another point to add about this slide is if the regime in Japan shifts from deflation to inflation, even, uh, you know, say on a, a rather uh, insignificant by global standards basis of, for example, 1% uh, nominal GDP, we could see an even higher multiple justified by higher nominal GDP growth, which again filters through to corporate earnings um, uh, for companies. So th the question then on um, everyone's minds, and I'm sure, you know, people tuning in today would like to hear is, with strong gains uh, year to date and uh, you know, even a pullback over the last couple of uh, days and weeks, um, how sustainable is this? And is now an attractive entry point or would it be time maybe to return to the normal playbook of underweight Japan? So on the screen here, I have shared our current house view, which is what uh, you know, we in turn share with investors. So um, I, I'm not going to read every single you know, point. I, I think that uh, you know, um, participants can, can read those, but I'll just uh, you know, give a few um, key comments about this. So for the Nikkei, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the, the main uh, index that uh, foreign investors typically buy um, to get exposure to the Japanese market, our midpoint estimate uh, for March 2024 is 34,500, and it implies about 7% upside from current levels. So, um, you know, uh, indeed, uh, particularly the uh, large cap oriented indices, the Nikkei has come a long way uh, since the beginning of the year, 25%. And 7% upside, you know, maybe it, uh, it, it does not seem um, like a, an attractive um, entry point uh, in itself at the moment. And I would, uh, you know, tend to agree with that. I think there's a much more you know, strong case uh, for an entry point in less overheated um, and crucially more domestic economy driven areas, such as uh, you know, the small cap market. Um, and we'll discuss those maybe uh, a little bit uh, later on, why um, I think that there may be even stronger prospects in terms of uh, risk return profile for investors. I think also though, it's important for an investor to look at uh, Japanese equity um, from a long-term perspective, uh, you know, among global equity in terms of maybe starting to gradually build a position. And, you know, something backing this is just the dividend yield uh, of the market and scope for increase um, in dividends, uh, as well as ongoing share uh, buybacks would add, uh, I would say, you know, mid single digit uh, uh, annualized uh, uh, return potentially to the market. Um, and this is before even considering corporate earnings growth, which we believe is the obviously the main driver has, has been shown to have a high correlation with market performance over the long term. So let's move on now then to talk about, uh, you know, some of the um, economic factors underpinning maybe the recovery uh, in Japan. So in the global economy, um, this slide shows uh, OECD, um, you know, GDP forecasts for Japan and uh, the other G7 countries. And so in the global economy, especially the developed economies, the story is really one of divergence at the moment. It's divergence in economic fundamentals, monetary policy, uh, politics. And in this respect, relatively high, higher GDP growth puts Japan in the spotlight. Um, and as we know, GDP is the key driver or uh, certainly a key driver in corporate earnings growth, which in turn is a key driver of stock market returns. 
So Japan looks very different to other advanced economies. We think that the uh, domestically driven growth trend in particular is resilient. And on the back of uh, three decades of deflation, inflation is actually a positive for the country. And I'll talk about more exactly why we think that uh, using the uh, next uh, in a few slides. So, um, you know, the strong performance in the domestic market is due both to, yes, temporary factors such as uh, a rebound in uh, inbound tourists coming back to Japan as Japan has uh, you know, reopened relatively later than other nations, but also, um, you know, strong, I would say, structural elements such as uh, underlying uh, strong uh, individual consumption and also private sector investment. Um, as companies uh, try to, I would say, future-proof themselves and to make uh, enhancements to productivity uh, to address issues such as the labor shortage. So um, let's turn over to the uh, next page where I have uh, added uh, a slide on monetary policy. So um, after trying desperately to instigate inflation for almost two decades, or sorry, over two decades, the BOJ likely views the current bout of inflation as an opportunity uh, more than a risk. And we don't think uh, it will want to pass up on this uh, opportunity by prematurely raising interest rates. Companies are incentivized to raise efficiency to protect margins and the obvious exogenous uh, pandemic shock also makes usually reluctant Japanese consumers more accepting of price, higher prices. Uh, for these reasons, we don't see the BOJ drastically modifying monetary policy in the near term. Uh, as you can see um, on the right-hand side, the BOJ currently uh, implements yield curve control, where it buys uh, government bonds to control long-term 10-year uh, government yields at below 0.5%. We expect that this cap may be lifted at the next uh, BOJ meeting in July to 0.75 or 1%. Uh, but as you can see, yield um, from the right-hand side chart there, yield is below the uh, cap of 0.5% um, as we speak, and we don't see a spike uh, in yields even if the cap is revised. We think BOJ is highly unlikely to, um, therefore, adjust the short-term rate um, until there are clear signs that deflation has been beating. So this monetary policy uh, you know, broadly is uh, positive for the equity market. On the next slide, uh, I have included uh, a chart on the concept of inflation. So the chart on the left shows that uh, inflation is far lower in Japan than other developed economies. This is mainly because of entrenched deflation, especially in private sector rents, uh, as well as uh, you know, government uh, measures to ease price rises and uh, also less immediate reflection of inflation in wages. But inflation has finally arrived in Japan uh, through higher import prices, particularly of energy, um, most of which Japan imports, as well as a weak yen. As you can see, CPI has increased to uh, just under 4%, uh, and core CPI around 3%. Import inflation pressure, though, driven last year largely by higher energy prices, uh, is now uh, fading. And um, this means inflation is likely to drift down um, before settling around the Bank of Japan's target uh, of 2%, even, you know, breaching the target on the downside. So we think that, um, you know, there's still uh, a way to go in terms of tolerance of uh, inflation, you know, in Japan. I will just touch upon a few risks because I think it's important for investors to have a balanced view. Uh, so we have higher utility prices now in Japan. Um, electricity prices, for example, have, uh, have risen. Um, price hikes in the utilities have been uh, approved by government and come into effect uh, you know, since June. Um, so the average bill for households is expected to rise uh, about 40% on last year. So, um, you know, we continue to see some upward momentum in prices here. Uh, and uh, this will be healthy if it's matched by real wage growth. But a risk factor would be, uh, you know, if the yen were to depreciate further, uh, perhaps to, you know, nearer to 150 um, versus the, the dollar uh, from where it is now at 143. So I want to just use uh, you know, another slide to talk about uh, how inflation is really an opportunity as opposed to a risk for Japan. And this is uh, you know, really a question of context. So as central banks around the world have battled to contain inflation, Japan stands as an outlier. And you can see that in this chart, which shows the uh, cumulative growth in the consumer price index since 1990. 
uh, being from the UK, uh, you know, this chart is uh, particularly striking for me. Um, and, you know, maybe our listeners in Singapore, uh, you know, may also, uh, you know, see how, how different the picture is in Japan uh, looking at this chart. So the, the real points are that this chart begins in 1990. So at that time, Japan was one of the most expensive destinations in the world. Uh, and this is the point in time when the economic bubble uh, uh, burst. And so the peak in the Japanese stock market. Since then, inflation ha uh, total has been just 19%. And you can see the deflationary period during the early 2000s, where prices uh, actually fell for a protracted uh, period of time. Because uh, companies couldn't increase selling prices, and because we didn't see enhancements, improvements in productivity, uh, this meant a stagnant economic growth. And uh, you know, Japanese consumption tax uh, was gradually hiked as well over the period. Um, to the current 10% level. And without those hikes, CPI growth would have actually been even lower than this. So, um, you know, to give you just a quick uh, anecdote, when I first came here in 2007, uh, I would usually have, you know, uh, a, a tempera, you know, tendon meal for my lunch. And it cost, uh, I think, about, you know, 400 yen, 390 yen. And that was about probably three US dollars at the time. Uh, when I that was in 2007. When I came to work full time in 2013, so six years later, uh, I bought the same dish uh, for exactly the same you know price, free tax price. So uh, you know while that was in way in a way good for me, it, it was not good for the economy. But there are you know signs of change here too. So many of you, uh, when you visit, you may have visited uh, you know one of the um, the sushi uh, go round restaurants. So one chain is called the uh, Sushi Roll. Um, and the key selling point of this uh, place used to be that one plate, no matter where you were in the country, with, you know, a good helping two uh, uh, pieces of sushi was 100 yen, you know, even in central Tokyo. But now I'm um, talking about, you know, improved corporate governance uh, and uh, you know, more focus on margins as opposed to top line, uh, increasing the top line. We see that this company has brought in a more intelligent, you know, pricing strategy. So price varies by location. Um, and plates, uh, you know, still extremely reasonable, in my opinion, uh, 120 to 150 yen uh, now. So lack of inflation actually, you know, is, is bad for the economy. And it means low wage growth as well. On the next uh, uh, um, slide, I want to just touch upon wage growth because it's an interesting point uh, lately. So we think recent developments in wage growth, uh, shown by the chart here, have uh, the potential to solidify regime change in the deflationary trend uh, and galvanize a uh, positive cycle of price and wage growth. And at the most recent uh, you know, round of wage negotiations this year, 3.7% um, uh, um, higher uh, wages, uh, driven by um, an inflation-sensitive component there shown in the, uh, the green line, uh, the base, the so-called base uh, pay, um, were, 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 have uh, you know, been historic uh, in terms of the achievement. Um, you can see that the line largely flat uh, going back. Um, and while this, uh, you know, we've not yet seen real uh, incomes rising in Japan, indeed, they've continued to fall, as imported uh, inflation pressures ease next year, we think that ongoing uh, strong wage growth will increase real incomes, which will be, um, you know, a further benefit for the domestic economy uh, through consumption. So I want to just talk about quickly, uh, you know, maybe two sides to the demographic uh, uh, issue. So uh, using this chart uh, we have on the screen here, Japan's population has fallen into negative growth. Um, and, you know, there's really no sugarcoating the fact that it creates challenges for the growth story going forward, especially at the top line, um, as we've talked about in terms of sales growth. Uh, however, addressing these challenges really creates a new set of opportunities, uh, which we think equity investors can potentially participate in. And I want to share exactly, you know, a, a bit more detail about that. So if we look at this slide, um, we've uh, consolidated some research on the right hand side by a Japanese uh, think tank that shows that uh, due to labor, uh, sorry, population decline, the labor shortage by 2040 could be as large as 11 million workers and some of the most likely to be affected uh, sectors we've listed there. So we think this that uh, will increase opportunities in uh, labor saving, uh, automation, and productivity enhancement, which are fields that uh, in some respects, especially uh, in um, factory uh, automation, for example, Japan already has core strength in. And research suggests that if Japan 
could increase labor productivity to the same level as the US from the current level. The current level is, uh, by the way, the worst among uh, G7 economies. It could increase GDP by up to 40%, 4-0. So that is uh, you know, non-significant. And uh, another interesting aspect is that uh, the government of Japan has uh, indicated that it's committed to supporting organic population growth, uh, but uh, we also you know, need to see, I would say, inorganic uh, population growth through immigration. And it, it going forward, we think it'll be critical for uh, Japan to attract foreign talent. Um, and indeed, various schemes have been put into place to aid this uh, you know, just uh, uh, recently, such as a fast track permanent residency and uh, indeed online applications for immigrants, uh, which uh, I myself have uh, taken advantage with and I can uh, assure you is much better than having to go to the office physically, which is what the previous uh, procedure was. So, um, you know, I just want to uh, speak uh, maybe to the opportunity um, in, uh, we're seeing in small mid caps actually, because it, it does, uh, you know, um, follow on very um, smoothly from the uh, the story of uh, you know strong domestic ec economic growth driven by consumption and investment, and so um, you know really uh, we talked about um, large cap performance being strong year to date, but small cap has really been lagging. Um, it's not just a Japan story. Um, in Japan, the topics uh, small index has lagged uh, the large index by about six percent year to date, and lagged the Nikkei by uh, ten percent. So, um, you know, buying, buying the, the Nikkei and the topics, investors can gain exposure to, uh, I would say, economically sensitive uh, companies, um, you know, uh, focused in, in areas such as automobiles, uh, machinery, electronic uh, components, you know, many of which very, uh, you know, household names, very strong companies. However, they're more susceptible to movements in the global economy, which we know um, there is uh, risk on the horizon from a potential uh, U.S. recession as well as uh, you know, perhaps uh, you know, uh, high damage from higher interest rates to investment in Europe, uh, and uh, you know, another um, set of uh, economic challenges in in China, particularly with the you know the local uh, the, the debt uh, situation uh, there, um, and uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, of economic stimulus there. Um, so we think there's a strong case at the moment to dig deeper into the extra uh, return potential of small caps. Um, based on you know the three factors uh, that we um, put on the screen, so that structural inefficiencies, uh, unique characteristics, and long-term outperformance. I want to spend uh, just a few minutes on each of these. So the first screen I think is is quite an interesting screen. It really shows um, some of the characteristics of the Japanese small cap market, which I would say, despite being the second largest uh, small cap market behind the U.S., is a very different market to the U.S. and very, uh, you know, I would say, unique in terms of uh, exploitability potentially for uh, active uh, fundamental driven investors. So the slide on the screen here shows that uh, analyst coverage in financial markets is extremely thin in Japanese small caps. If you look at the bottom uh, part of the slide, the topic small index ha has just an average of one analyst uh, covering companies. And this is uh, due to really the huge number of companies. There are over uh, you know, 3,500 uh, small and mid cap companies in Japan. And indeed, it's very uh, difficult, particularly with the lack of uh, commitment to Japan as an, an investment de destination uh, over the last uh, you know, 10, 20 years uh, to uh, you know, really spend the time and to allocate the resources necessary to get to know these companies. Um, and also because many of these companies are not exemplary companies and you know, corporate fundamentals do not really justify share price growth. Um, we don't think that uh, in small caps, uh, necessarily, the best approach is to uh, buy an index uh, in the similar way, you know, to the Nikkei or, or the topics. We think that uh, investors uh, could do uh, better in terms of uh, risk return by perhaps taking a more discerning approach and, uh, you know, kind of searching for diamonds in the rough. Uh, but when you do find diamonds in this space, um, and many Japanese small caps truly are, I would say, uh, you know, fantastic companies, even by global standards, uh, but, but backed by, uh, you know, for example, pure play exposure to higher growth niche areas, such as advanced materials uh, and electric vehicles, uh, high global market share and strong franchises in value chains, uh, including semiconductors, 
um, and also dominant offerings in, as we've talked about, labor productivity and digitalization uh, locally. Um, you know, many of these are actually underpriced uh, in our view. So we think that prospective returns for active investors could be even higher uh, taking this so-called, uh, you know, diamonds in the rough uh, approach. So this poor uh, coverage of the market makes it uh, very inefficient in terms of the way companies are priced and difficult for investors to navigate. Uh, we think that uh, you know, active stock pickers could have more opportunities by applying a diligent research and uh, perhaps in some cases patient investment process to the market um, and also uh, you know, being positioned to access and ask the right questions um, to stakeholders uh, of the various companies. Um, often another point is uh, smaller companies often do not uh, provide much disclosure in English, which makes it difficult for, uh, you know, more difficult uh, in our view for non-local uh, firms um, and investors to navigate the space. So we think that, uh, you know, on the ground presence uh, and deep uh, local expertise uh, of uh, Sumitomo Mitsui and uh, other, you know, active managers in Japan is certainly, um, you know, something that investors could look at. Uh, for an, uh, an allocation to small caps. So on the next page, I've listed a couple more unique characteristics of small cap equities. The small cap universe itself is well balanced in terms of industries. We talked about how large caps are skewed towards global growth um, in, for example, autos manufacturing. Um, but small caps tend to have more exposure to structural Japan-specific themes, uh, such as supporting digital transformation, um, and uh, again, even more niche and unique demand, um, such as uh, you know modern end of life services, and even uh, a current phenomenon of uh, virtual YouTubers, so uh, so called VTubers. Um, and at the same time, you know it also offers investors to um, access to companies plugged into, as we say, uh, global value chains. So. Um, we really think that, uh, you know, there are strong prospects on a fundamental level for small caps. If we look at price action as well, over the past, uh, you know, long term here, we have 24 years of data here. Uh, we've shown that uh, small caps have outperformed uh, over the long term. So in the third largest economy, uh, there is ample room to grow both sales and profits for companies with the right business models, uh, products and services in even small niches. And this is one of the unique points of the Japanese markets, uh, I would say. And uh, so using the same you know, markets as we have here um, on the screen. So the blue line is topic small, uh, which has outperformed um, the large cap uh, indices uh, shown in uh, light green there um, and uh, purple by uh, you know, a strong margin over the long term, backed by uh, corporate uh, you know, earnings growth and, uh, and sales growth. So we think in particular now could be um, an interesting entry point, uh, uh, perhaps for investors. And these several uh, extra reasons on the screen really highlight that. So one of them is that the small caps are really not participating in the equity rally so far. So it's more difficult for foreign investors to access these. We talked about lack of uh, you know, information, transparency, uh, misunderstood, uh, uh, companies, etc. Some of these companies, uh, you know, have long, strong track records. Have, uh, for example, relatively good, uh, solid shareholder policies, despite reputation of, you know, being more, I would say, uh, heavy at the top in terms of uh, perhaps maybe, uh, you know, ownership structure that's not contingent to uh, a strong uh, shareholder return for the minority shareholders. Um, and uh, as we talked about domestic economy prospects, we think are stronger relative currently um, to uh, the global market. And uh, as the economy reopens post-COVID, um, corporate uh, you know, capex is still strong, particularly in uh, software. Um, so companies exposed to that area, we think have uh, you know, room to uh, grow earnings, but also grow the share price. Uh, potentially, which has been um, dampened, um, you know, I would say more uh, due to preference for large caps as opposed to any uh, fundamental issues with uh, the small cap market. The final chart is just really a, a, you know, a closing piece. I think from a technical perspective, it's also an opportune moment uh, potentially to look at small caps. Um, the green line, light green line there is, uh, shows the difference between the return of the 
uh, Nikkei, so the large cap index, uh, versus the uh, small cap index. You can see that uh, it's currently um, showing uh, almost minus uh, 20 percent, which is close to the historic uh, uh, bottom in terms of uh, yeah, undervalue, uh, you know, depth of undervalue to uh, large caps. And uh, we think that, you know, given particularly the stronger um, uh, outlook for uh, corporate earnings growth in small caps, backed by domestic economy growth, uh, this could be an attractive um, a point. So I'll leave it there for the um, presentation um, and hand back to uh, you, Bart. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Alex, for the comprehensive and informative presentation. Um, before we move on to the q and I'd like to share a little bit on the UOB AM Invest app. Let me share my screen here. Yep. All right. So um, everybody, you can use your mobile phone to scan the QR code and download the UOBM Invest app from App Store or Play Store. And that now that you download the app, you can start with UOBM Invest in just a simple few steps. You can enter your mobile and email address for verification. And that after that, you create your username and password and you have successfully set up your secure user account. With this, you can um, explore our funds, you can get insights to our research, and you can download the app to take a look. So, so when we move on to Fund Direct, um, you can scroll down to the Fund Direct tile, click on it, and you can start exploring the funds on our UOBM Invest app. Click on the Browse Our Funds, and type in the keyword in the search bar on top and you can find the funds that you are looking for. You can browse the performance and information via the tabs on top for research, and you can just add to the cart and check out if you'd like to subscribe to the fund. And that is it. The whole process is quite simple. And if you have any questions or queries, you can always reach out to me or my colleagues. Right. You can follow us on LinkedIn or Facebook to get insights, tips, and the latest market updates. And with this, let's move on to the Q&A session. Right. So Alex, um, we have two questions. Um, so what are your thoughts on the valuation of Japanese stocks? Do you believe that the stocks are currently undervalued or overvalued? Yeah, it's a really um, excellent you know, question and something that uh, I think is really um, a story, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not really a, a unilateral story. There, there are All two right. sides, okay. and I would say characterized maybe by the two themes um, that we discussed, uh, you know, throughout the presentation, one of them being, uh, you know, smaller mid caps versus large caps, mm -hmm. and perhaps also domestic economy driven versus external environment driven. So performance, um, you know, coming into 2023, uh, the leadership in Japanese equities has been focused around, um, I would say, more uh, hardware, uh, potentially tech uh, uh, adjacent names, particularly, um, you know, after the, the, the AI um, peak in interest uh, with um, NVIDIA's earnings, and then mm -hmm. names like, uh, for example, chip testing, uh, you know, Adventest, et cetera. Um, okay. And the valuations of these names have, um, you know, appreciated considerably. Um, and very often, um, as we talked about, uh, names that, um, that, that tend to uh, see um, interest from foreign investors early on in um, a rally in the market, which we believe uh, we are current, uh, currently, you know, um, in uh, in terms of the the current position in the cycle for Japan, um, mm -hmm. we see that large caps have you know have led, and the valuations of large caps have become stretched actually in okay. my view and in the firm's view. Um, and so, if we talk in terms of price earnings, uh, the, the the Nikkei, uh, you know, more more in the the mid twenties, so that's actually a higher price to earnings than, uh, for example, the S and P five hundred. Topics is around uh, fifteen times. That's a broader index. So Nikkei is really a price in driven index. So it's not a very good comparison actually in some in some respects. Um, uh, around fifteen times, whereas small caps. Um, the small cap topics index, you know, trading uh, potentially below, you know, 13 times, which is cheap versus history, um, 
and okay. also uh, yeah cheap uh, versus global uh, compet- uh, markets as well so yeah i, I, I think that uh, there's really two stories to that and i think that um, you know small and mid caps are uh, certainly uh, undervalued um, at this point in time all right cool uh, there's a question that leads into this which sectors in the japanese small mid caps excite use the most and have the greatest return potential in your view how is the small cap fund that SMDAM position? Sure. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, for, I, I would say, you know, just to, to preface it, detailed information on uh, in individual products, um, right. I would, uh, you know, advise our listener to uh, contact the local, uh, you know, UA, UOB um, AM sales um, to talk about that. But I'm very willing to, uh, you know, provide an, over, an overview of it. So I think that what we've really talked about, you know, in the uh, presentation, digitalization, um, as well as uh, the uh, the more um, labor productivity, um, labor force supplementation um, side uh, of the market is, uh, you know, is really has the greatest uh, return potential um, okay. at the moment. And, and the reason for that is, uh, yes, there is uh, potential for sustained earnings growth um, based on the, you know, I would say the mega uh, trends in Japan, such as the, the, the need to increase productivity, uh, but also there's a very low uh, starting point. So Ooh. coming out of uh, COVID, um, and some of these names, um, let's just uh, add as well, particularly in the human resources area, will have had one-off, um, you know, earnings, uh, uh, I would say, one-off items in their earnings from um, the pandemic. So okay. as those drop out uh, going forward and we re- re- return to more of a, uh, you know, I would say a, a fundamental driven, um, you know, stock uh, price formation kind of price discovery um, based on, you know, long term earnings growth prospects, which can be in Japanese small caps, you know, as much as 20, 30 percent is, is not okay. unheard of growing right. earnings from right. a small base. Um, we, we think that uh, particularly uh, those two areas, uh, there are some uh, interesting opportunities. One other thing I would add is um, in uh, Japan at the moment, there is a national uh, commitment towards the growth strategy and particularly mm. in uh, you know, bringing back uh, production. Uh, this is a theme also we're seeing in the US you know, with friendshoring, nearshoring right. and reshoring. Okay. Of production, um, so I would say companies with uh, you know maybe um, uh, exposure further away from the end demand of uh, the semiconductor value chain, but more in the production equipment and the construction of factories, of which there are many um, you know small caps, also um, are poised to uh, perform strongly going forward. And uh, I think that uh, you know some of our positioning at SMDM uh, reflects that as well. Thank you. Um... There's one question from our audience is that what is the yield that we are looking at? Okay, so um, this question, does it refer to the dividend yield um, of the Japanese market or the particular uh, strategy? The the market in general, um, the dividend yield is around 2.5% at the moment. It's been growing um, you know, ten percent ish, uh, both growth and dividend. Thank you very much. It's been growing about <laughs> right. ten, very, uh, you know, very, very helpful there. Um, it's been growing at about ten percent on a yearly basis. If you look mm-hmm. at how strong Japanese companies are in terms of balance sheets, um, as well as uh, you know, even income statements, really with improvements, uh, potential for improvement in margin. Um, and, uh, you know, um, removal of inefficiency through, for example, consolidation M&A. Um, I think that uh, that's certainly sustainable going forward. So for the markets around that level, um, small caps, um, you know, many people think of small caps as just growth names that do not pay dividends. Uh, it's not actually true. Um, there are many um, excellent, uh, you know, I would say uh, stable uh, companies in Japan, um, the Japanese market that do pay dividends. And you can achieve um, a dividend yield of maybe three uh, percent, uh, you know, three point five four percent. Even with um, obviously the stronger uh, potential for price appreciation in small caps, so I think it's really a, uh, something worth looking at. And I think that the um, return uh, in terms of the dividend of even the market, the broader market, is also um, quite attractive uh, for uh, investors looking at uh, you know a return in yen terms. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, and then we have the last question is that aren't small and mid-cap companies more volatile? Are there a greater risk of losing the money? 
Yeah, and um, again, yeah, it's a really relevant question, and it is a common uh, concern that's shared not just by, uh, I would say, individual investors, but also by institutional investors. And this mm. is why we would advocate, or sorry, uh, we would, uh, we would, uh, we, 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 we would maybe think about uh, a more diversified approach in small caps. Um, so uh, really, uh, you know, small caps can be subject to individual company, you know, specific risks. And uh, they're not always foreseeable. Um, so it's, uh, I would say, responsible to build a portfolio uh, designed to uh, you know, reflect, yes, uh, the return that you want to achieve, but also um, reflect the risk, uh, you know, both in the macro environment, um, as well as maybe you know, unforeseen uh, so-called uh, specific uh, stock risk. So um, small caps, yeah, in terms of... Um, in terms of volatility, uh, if you look at an index like the uh, the small cap growth index in Japan, which mm -hmm. is the mother's index, which is really a startup uh, focused index, yes, price volatility is uh, is high. It's much higher than the large cap uh, indices. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, it is focused, uh, you know, on um, really, I would say, uh, you know, potential, um, you know, danger to future cash flows with, uh, for example, monetary policy changes, etc. However, if you look at something like the small uh, topic, small index, uh, which is more of a broad measure, including uh, not just growth companies, but value, you know, a, a whole broad uh, market spectrum, uh, the volatility is not actually much higher than um, the, the broader index. Um, so I think that really the diversification is the real name of the game there. Thank you. And I realize there's right. one more question. Let's just yeah. come in. Thank you very much. Probably in the interest of time, this will be the last question they will be taking, Alex. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So what is the definition of a small and mid-cap in Japan? Yeah, that's, again, um, uh, it's a very good question. Perhaps I should have mentioned it right. in the portfolio, in the, uh, in the presentation, <laughs> right. sorry. But, um, no. So topics, the uh, listed uh, you know, index, um, the, the, the market uh, essentially in Japan is about 2,000 names. Um, and then there are other indices um, with you know, the growth markets, et cetera. Uh, in total, there's about 3,600 names. Everything outside of the 500 largest names in topics so that's topics 100, like your, your, your household names, Toyota, et cetera, and topics mid cap 400 is considered to be small cap. So it's actually, uh, you know, in total, uh, just over 3,100 uh, uh, names. Better to, uh, you know, break it down that way as opposed to uh, give, uh, you know, I would say uh, concrete ideas of, uh, of in monetary terms. Um, mm. you know, just for, yeah, for, for, for ease of uh, understanding and because things do fluctuate, you know, with the exchange rate, uh, et cetera. In right. <laughs> So it's probably, yeah, the, the bottom, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent market kick cap uh, companies in Japan. OK. OK, thank you, Alex. Um, I think with that, we've come to the end of today's session. Um, I hope you guys have found the session informative and do join us for the next session. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Right.